Hi everyone. First, thank you for attending the SolidCam Virtual Summit, and I hope that everyone is learning a lot about SolidCam. My name is Anthony Calderon, and I am the Chief Technical Officer at SolidCam. In this presentation, I will be talking about iMachining AI. Let's get started. Let's begin by talking about AI or artificial intelligence. In general, AI refers to machines that are programmed to think and act like human intelligence. In machining, the CAM programmer is using all of their past experiences to make decisions on how to program a part. Each of us is visually looking at a part and taking in its geometry, the machine it's being cut on, the work holding, and so on to determine the proper machining. Even as we are programming a CAM part, we are taking into account the previous operations to understand what we're going to do next. Programming parts for machining is an insanely complex task that requires tremendous experience and problem solving. This is why human intelligence is required for the programming of CNC manufactured parts. To the best of my knowledge, there does not exist a CNC that has a scanner for 2D drawings and pops out a CNC machined part. This leads us to iMachining AI. I'm sure everyone is thinking, great, another company adding buzzwords to their product. Okay, maybe this did originate from a marketing perspective. Yet with AI and machine learning becoming standard words in technology today, we realize that iMachining is and always was AI. I know, you need more information than just iMachining is AI. So let's jump into the deep end and dissect what our brains do when we program in CAM. I am for warning you that this is going to get complex. Here's our part. It's pretty awesome, right? I designed it myself, so I'm pretty stoked about it. Now I'm going to assume that this part has already been quoted by somebody in the company, and we already got the order for this part. So all I have to do is eventually machine 30 good parts, and my boss will love me. Well, we already know we don't work for the government, so eventually is not true. I'm going to have to deliver these parts in a timely fashion. Also, I'm expected not to break a lot of tools or scrap parts or else we will lose our profit. So the reality is I have some pretty lofty goals I need to meet for my boss to love me. That was a bit of a tangent, but these thoughts are playing in my head while I'm making decisions about programming this part. So we're going to make this part from 7075. It fits in my Haas UMC 500, and holding it in my 5-axis vise will actually be perfect for the first machining setup. Now starts my human decision making. What's my plan for machining this part? Looking at it, I would say that I'm going to machine these two ledges first. Then I would like to rotate the B axis 90 degrees and cut these angled faces with the radius. Then I'd like to rotate it back to the top and then finish the outside. So I want to cut these two ledges first. So now I have to fire up my internal flow chart and decision making process. I want to open up Notepad and kind of help show my decisions a little bit. Okay, what tool do I want to use? Okay, first thought. So I could use my insert mill or I could use an end mill. So insert mill or end mill. If I use an insert mill or if I use my insert face mill, it's a bit like taking a sledgehammer to a finishing nail. And it's going to leave steps on my vertical wall that I'm going to have to clean up afterwards. So I think I'm going to choose an end mill. Then my next thing is, what operation am I going to use? And this is really a tough decision. So I could use profile. I could use pocket. I could use pocket recognition. I could use five axis. I could use toolbox. I could use HSR, and all of these are valid options to machine this ledge. 
and all of them are going to require some level of tinkering to get an optimized toolpath. So let's think a bit, a little bit here. HSR is cool because it's kind of like a one-click roughing, but it's not going to be easy to limit it to just these two ledges. Five axis would be really cool, but seriously, why am I th even thinking of five axis? I will imp impress my colleagues with my awesome cam knowledge, but it's just going to take a lot of work to make it work. I could probably use a toolbox cycle, but it's not a specific geometry condition. So pocket and profile are probably going to give me more flexibility while I'm programming it. I like using pocket a lot. And even though I know that pocket cuts any type of geometry, closed, open, semi-open, I kind of have a brain block where I feel like I should use pocket on traditionally closed pockets. So I'm going to switch to profile. Okay, now comes, we want to do a profiling operation. So add milling, add profile. Now what do I need to do to get a profiling operation done? Okay, let's go back to our notepad file. We need a tool. We need geometry. We need Z levels. And then we need some, some technology. Those are the main parts. So let's go ahead and do some of this now. I'm going to go pick our tool. From our new tool table, I already have a half inch end mill set up in a one and three quarter inch long holder and my cap 40 spindle. I can open up my machine preview if I care to see what my holder and tool looks like in my UMC 500. I'm going to select my end mill. So next I want to do is define some geometry. I need to pick my two edges that the ledge belongs to. We name our geometry, let's call it ledges. We need to define our levels. I am going to pick my upper level as the top of the stock. So I pick it right off my model. And then my profile depth, I am going down to the face. Both of my faces are marked in green, meaning I have an associative link. Now at this point, I'm just going to calculate my operation. OK, here's the, we get a tool path. Let's go take a look at that, what it looks like in the simulation. I'm just going to single step through, and here we see a bunch of problems. We can see that we have the we have collisions with the arbor and the stock. We can saw we plunged on the material. So already I got a tool path, but I need to now start tinkering with it to get the proper final tool path. So we're going to exit the simulation again. So let's start making some changes. OK, what do we want to change? Well, here, I'm going to have several things I need to change. So first off, my lead in and lead out, I'm going to have to change them. I'm going to have to change my step down because we're not going to take this thing in one shot. We're also going to have to do some step over. And also, if we like, we also may have to worry about do we want to, do we want to finish with this tool. So let's go make changes, and then we'll see the results of those changes. So first thing, I'm going to go my lead in and lead out and say, mm, I don't need an arc lead in and lead out. I literally just want a nice tangent extension. So we're going to go to tangent. We're going to do 60% of the tool. That is going to bring us exactly to our edge here. But we have material from the edge of the stock to the edge of our face. So if I measure this, we roughly have 0.25 of material. So I'm going to add an additional tangent extension of 
And I'm going to do the same thing for the lead out. We're going to calculate. Looks pretty nice. We can turn on our tool on mouse, put our mouse right there, and we can see that the tool has a little bit of clearance. So my lead in and lead out, I'm pretty happy with that. Now I'm going to go to our step downs. And so now we're doing finishing, but we know we also want to do roughing because we need to do some, some offset passes. So first thing we want to do, let's do roughing and we need some step down. I got a half inch end mill. Mm, I'm cutting aluminum. My tool's not sticking out too far. So yeah, I think I can do a quarter inch step down. I think that'll be okay. Um, five thousandths on the wall. Yeah, I think that's also, I think that's pretty good. Um, I'm going to do my, my clear offset. Uh, my clear offset, this is going to give me some multiple passes to, to clear this. So I'm just going to take this and measure it. I got one inch. So I'm going to put a clear offset of like point, point 0.75. My step over is going to be a quarter inch. That's 50% of the tool radius. It's aluminum, more, more or less. I think that's, I think that's pretty good. Gonna go save and calculate. Okay, looks like a lot of, a lot of passes. Let's go see what it looks like in the simulation. Gonna uncheck my tool path and then just play it and see what we get. Oh, that played pretty fast. So let's slow it down a bit. Yeah, I, I, I think that's pretty. Uh, I think that's pretty decent. The tool's plunging out in air. We're taking constant steps over. Everything's climb cutting. I think it's, uh, I think it's uh, pretty good. Taking a look at this, hmm. Wait a second, I see something interesting here. Ah, I see a step here. Why do I have that step? Because my tool is relieved. So I need multiple step downs for my finishing or else my wall's not going to be finished. So now I have to go back to my operation and say, ah, okay, I need a finishing step down. I think in finishing, I can go probably a half inch instead of the quarter inch we're using for the step down. Just going to calculate. Let's run the simulation again. Minimize the operation. We'll play it, do it a little bit quicker this time. Yeah, that looks, that looks very, very nice to me, okay? So, from my side, I would say that's pretty good. Operation looks nice. Tool path looks as expected. No plunging on materials. Everything's nice. We're done with it, right? No. Now comes feeds and speeds. We didn't even think about any of that. So now we've got to go think about feeds and speeds. Okay. Now, I have a lot of experience with aluminum. I come from cutting aluminum parts in aerospace, so now I have experience. What's my experience? Well, I pretty much cut everything at 12,000 RPMs. It's just what I do. I know we can more or less cut everything at 12,000 RPMs, so I stick with 12,000 RPMs. What am I going to do for feed rates? Well, normally I would end up going and looking at either some speed and feed chart, I'd look at the end mill manufacturer, see what their recommended things are. That's usually where all of us start. And then in our shop, we use our machine, we know what we can do, and then we adjust from there. So my side, I know 120 inches a minute, that's, that's pretty decent. So um, I'm going to do 120 inches a minute. My feed Z, um, I, can, I can do the same 120 inches a minute because my feed Z is not actually, when I do my Z plunging, I'm out in air. So I know that this tool is plunging in air and I can set a faster, a faster Z feed. Obviously this tool cannot plunge at 120 inches a minute in the material. Maybe if we're doing helical entry, but not a straight down plunge. So if we also look at this operation, we can see down here in the slider bar, it was seven minutes before, which kind of makes sense because I think the feed rate said it was like 40 inches a minute. If I look at my, my chip load per tooth, we can see I got three thou. So for anybody that cuts aluminum, three thou, three and a half thou, that's pretty decent. I mean, I could, obviously aluminum, depending on your fixture, your tool, 
how far it's sticking out, half inch end mill, for sure we could cut probably faster than three and a half thou chip load, but I'm a conservative guy, I'm cutting it in my five axis vise, I'm not looking for the thing to go flying out, so 120 inches a minute seems nice to me. If we can simulate it one more time, because the nice thing about the simulation is it gives us the time. So here down on the bar, we can see two minutes and four seconds. Watching it run, yeah, that's, uh, that's not too bad. I'm pretty happy with it. So we can kind of we can kind of go back to our notepad file here and look at all the things I had to think about and decide as I was working. I already have tools in my machine shop, so I didn't have to worry about going to a manufacturer and even going picking a new tool. I knew I had an insert mill because I cut aluminum all the time, so I got my two and a half inch insert mill I can use anytime I like. I got my end mills, I know what I use, we have them. I still have to decide which tool am I going to use. Then I had to decide what operation am I going to use. There is no perfect answer to what operation to use, and this is every CAM software. All the operations are meant to remove material. Obviously, I'm not going to go using a drilling operation to mill away some material, but there's lots of different operation based on what we use. I mean, technically, I could have used a five-axis swarf cutting operation to try and cut that wall. It, no, there's nothing that stops me in, from saying a five-axis toolpath can only cut a, a wavy five-axis surface. They could cut it. 2D surface, no problem. The question becomes, what's the right tool? What are the options you're going to use? And how hard is it going to be? So there's no right or wrong. Then once you even decide that, you then have to decide for almost any operation that you choose, what's the geometry? What's the tool you're using? What are the Z levels that you're cutting? And then you have all the technology parameters. And then, like I didn't even mention here, you then have all the speeds and feeds. So all these things are things that we, as a CAM programmer, we're trying to think about, and we're trying to manage. We're using our human experience to understand what, le what options to pick. And generally, this is not even something we can fully define ahead of time. Until you go to the simulation and you see what the tool is doing and how it's cutting the stock, you don't know. Like, I could have maybe looked at this and been like, okay, I know I should use tangent. I know I should use clear offset. I, you do those things, and you still have to come back after simulating and tweak things if you want to run it optimized. Or even if it's not optimized, you still might have just picked something wrong, like even I did with the finishing. I forgot on the finishing to put multiple step downs. I don't even have to go into my technology wizard and pick what level and everything. I'm happy with the defaults. I'm just going to leave them. Wall offsets, all those things are defined automatically based on the tool radius, so I don't have to do anything. In this case, though, I am going to set the floor offset to zero because that's what we did at the other operation. We just assumed the, the floor finish did not need a separate finish. And we calculate. And that's it. Three or four clicks, that's the operation. So let's go into the simulation and actually see what this did and took care of it, what it took care of for us. So if we play, we can see that iMachining automatically takes care of all the stock and everything. So it is taking care of the stock in multiple levels. It took care of the upper level automatically for us. It took care of the stock when said, how am I going to extend my tool path to cut just the stock? It automatically knew what to do with the lead in and lead out to plunge out an air. It didn't have to ask us for any tinkering in the operation to define those tool paths. Honestly, we didn't even have to pick the feeds and speeds. We didn't have to pick the step downs, the step overs. Everything was done with the experience of iMachining. It knows, it took, looks at, it analyzes the tool, it knows what, even the finishing, we can see with the finishing, it knew to do multiple depth of cuts because it knows the flute length. So all those things that our human intelligence and decision making does, in iMachining, we take care of 
almost all of it. This is AI. This is a computer. It has been programmed to make human intelligence decisions. Depending upon what we do, it is a different result. It isn't just not some like lookup table or something. Everything is an algorithm and everything is looking back and it's coded to think like we do as machinists. So all those things, it just automatically took care of by itself. And if we look at the operation, one minute and 11 seconds, if I remember correctly, I think the previous operation was like 144. So even if we went and said, okay, I wonder what feeds and speeds um, iMachining did. Well, I mean, we can see RPM, it did 10,000 RPMs at 145 inches a minute. And we know from what I picked, I picked 12,000 RPMs and 120 inches a minute. Now, the difference being here is that iMachining is calculating all the forces and everything. When I'm picking my feeds and speeds, I'm using my own past experiences to do my feed and speed. Like I know with my, with my half inch end mill, if it does full width slotting, I need to slow it down or I need to do lower depth of cuts. With iMachining the wizard, it took care of everything. So if I wanted to cut faster, I, I could kick up the RPM a little bit and try to cut faster. But as you see with iMachining, it's already faster even at slower RPMs because everything is managed in a different way. And if we do look at the chip thickness, the chip thickness iMachining picked four and a half thou. So like I said before, we knew with our tool that we could go higher than our three, our three and a half thou chip thickness. So uh, with iMachining, everything is controlled. So like I'm comfortable with this. I, I might not be comfortable picking that high a chip thickness with a standard tool path because you don't know if it's over, going to over engage anywhere. And that's our tool path there. We can go, we can go jump into the machine simulation. This is only the first operation, but this is machine simulation, cutting, cutting the part, and that's our iMachining, iMachining tool path doing that. I can turn off the machine housing as well. Let us summarize what we covered today. CAM programming requires a lot of experience and iterative decisions involving simulation of toolpaths and verifying the result. When using iMachining, the experience of CNC machining is baked into the software covering technology and speeds and feeds. Programming time and errors are dramatically reduced while cycle times are easily cut in half. I hope everyone walks away from this presentation with the goal of standardizing on iMachining for the majority of their CAM programming needs. It is silly not to enjoy our amazing technology, which is available to each and every one of us.